Like settle into the fact that I can't do everything, mm. right? So I learned, um, I would say a few years ago, that there is no such thing as balance. People say I'm a balance, there's no such thing. So what you have to do is, prior, what's, what's gonna be your priority for the day? And, and, and let me look on your face shit. and tell you, let me look on your face and tell you this. Every day it's not Oof. gonna be your children. Yeah, wow. it yeah. Can't get be. to the cake. I'm on a mission for me, no matter how long it's gonna take. I could just see it already. Give me that new Benz or the Wraith. Watching my own back where I'm from, it was never safe. Yeah. Need a hundred M's, it been a safe. Last chance, life a movie. Roll another one and get baked. Mix the honor wealth with the. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to yet another season of Between the Lines podcast. I'm super honored. Before we get started, just be sure to go check out the entire season one on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio. On every single platform. Uh, but today we have an amazing, an amazing guest, the Honorable Miss Ashley Christopher. <laughs> Super honored to have you as the first guest. I think that's like, uh, that's a huge milestone of mine. I think that's very big. But everything that you do in the community, with your organizations, I just want to say thank you for getting on the show. Um, I know you're very busy. You have a lot of obligations. So if you take some time out, I appreciate you. No, right? thank you for having me. So before we get started, just go ahead and just introduce yourself and let the people know what you got going on. Of course. Uh, my name is Ashley Christopher. I'm the founder and CEO of HBC Week Foundation. Started back in 2017. Uh, we've grown incredibly in ways that I couldn't have imagined. Um, and I'm really excited about what's to come. But I won't get into everything. I'll wait until you ask me some questions. I love it. Yeah. But I do. So before we even get into that, I do want to like read something from your bio that I've learned about HBC Week because I think these are very important stats, and I think. The audience needs to, you know, hear about this, especially sure. those who's not familiar with HBCU Week. So in HBCU Week, you know, an initiative that they have is a college fair, mm -hmm. right? So I know the cornerstone of, you know, HBCU Week is the college fair. The fair is unique because participating colleges engage in an on-spot acceptance, acceptance process whereby if attending students come equipped with the requisite SAT, ACT score, and GPA, they can be offered acceptance on the spot and a scholarship award. Mm -hmm. To date, now this might have changed because I don't know how long your bio been up there. Okay. But to date, over 2,800 acceptances on the spot have been offered and over $11.5 million in scholarships have been awarded. Now listen to this, 2,641 on the spot acceptances from the 2022 college fair. 609 um, number of partial scholarships offered, 934 scholarships in total. That's awesome, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just want to ask you, where did the, the passion, the vision for HBCU Week stem from? Like, when did that become something that you knew you wanted to do? Yeah, so I'm a lawyer by trade, so I'm a licensed attorney in two jurisdictions. Amazing. And I tried for a while to figure out what it was that I wanted. Like, when I was a kid, it was like, I'm going to be an entertainment lawyer and a criminal defense attorney. That's that was the plan since I was very young. Um, and when I went through the process, uh, went to law school, made some great connections. I struggled with the bar exam, but did pass. Mm. I did a clerkship, um, and that's comprised of going to court every day with different judges, mm -hmm. listening to both parties, um, helping them render decisions. I learned that the traditional practice of law just wasn't for me. Got you. Um, so I pivoted. You know, I, in 2017, I started to work for Mayor Mike Przicki. Um, and he charged me with coming up with programs directly pointed at Wilmington's most underserved communities. Mm, and that's how you pivoted into just wanting to do. Yes. That's awesome. Wow, yes. that's, a, that's, a yes. pretty, that's a pretty nice. So what did that teach you? Obviously, the, the responsibility of what you'll be doing in HBCU Week, you think? Like, did it prepare you necessarily? Like, um, with the things that you were doing with them, did it kind of translate over very well? Oh, the skill set coming from law school and that experience up until HBCU Week was founded, that skill set is transferable Amazing. amongst everything that I do. Amazing. Um, there are things I've learned. The main thing people ask me all the time about law school, if I don't know the answer, I can find it. Mm, no matter what can. it is that you ask it. me. I might not know right now, but I can come back and find it. And that's the, the best skill. Um, and it ain't gonna take me too long. Gotcha. And that's the best skill that I learned from, from law school. Um, outside of learning to really advocate mm -hmm. in an articulate way, yeah. um, to pick a position and you know, that, that can be applied um, no matter what career you try to go awesome. and pursue. 
Um, and just staying on the right side of history. Got you. You know, right is right and wrong is wrong, you know? Yeah, and I know you started, so HBC, we started in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, so from 2017 until, so you start, you know, we was talking a little bit about this off camera before we started recording, but mm -hmm. you start, you know, in person, doing it in Delaware, you know, everybody being able to travel, but then COVID happens in 2020, mm -hmm. right? In which you guys had your first time doing it virtual. How was the experience, you know, did it kind of work in your favor? Because I know when it's virtual, you can have more people attend, you know, in case yeah. people can't travel. So did it kind of work in your favor, you think? Like, how was that process for you guys being able to, in lack of better words, make the pivot, yeah. right, to yeah. virtual because of COVID? Well, I'll say I just love in-person interaction. Like, gotcha. human interaction cannot be duplicated, um, particularly when it comes to the college fair, because mm -hmm. if anybody's ever been on site at the fair you see how electric that it. room is when you see the students like in tears because they're getting accepted on the spot getting full rides um, even in the midst of you know celebrating with their friends and mm -hmm. if their family comes to the fair with them that's unmatched right yeah. and i love that part like that's as you mentioned the cornerstone event of what we do it's the most impactful most important um but the virtual event was what we had to do to keep the yeah, momentum keep going. going. And what we learned was um, this was an initiative that was deserving of crossing state lines. Mm -hmm. um, because up until this past year, it was only done in Wilmington. Got you. Um, and as we continued to grow, we had people coming down from the tri-state area. Amazing. You know, they would bust in and, and they would ask, well, when are you going to do it here? When are you going to do it there? And we thought about it and we talked about it, but we never really acted on it. Got it. Uh, but when we saw the amount of students logging in to the virtual college fair in 2020 from all over the country, we knew, okay, it's time to take this show on the road. Amazing. Yeah. And I, I, it's crazy. I, I know you should be smiling a little bit when you start talking about that because as soon as you mentioned uh, doing it in different places, I realized that you just did your first in Disney as well, Orlando. Yes. Um, how, how did you prepare for that? Like, what, how did that even come about? Like, was that always a plan? Did they reach out to you? Did you kind of do your, your due diligence to reach out? Like, how did that collab even come into place? Because you have places, like, let's say New York, for example, where all yeah. these people coming from all the tri-state area, mm -hmm. you could have done that easily, sure. right? But to go somewhere like Orlando mm -hmm. and Disney, yeah. it's like, I know that takes a lot more. So, like, how was that, like, that whole process? Well, um, as you're aware, Stephen A. Smith is our brand ambassador. Um, yep. The biggest sports anchor in the world, right? The face of ESPN, mm -hmm. right? And Disney happens to own ESPN. So um, with his involvement, we had conversations about how to make this bigger. Um, and I have to give credit to both Stephen A. Smith and uh, David Roberts, who, the, who is the vice president mm. of production for ESPN. at First Take, um, yeah, for ESPN. Mm. Um, and I spoke to them about taking it on the road and, and, and Dave said, you should do this in Disney World. Yeah. And that was something that my nice. mind haven't, mm. hasn't even, you know, had a chance to wrap around still. Because that's like the biggest stage in the world. Like mm -hmm. name a brand bigger than Disney. Right. Yeah, that's like, crazy. So um, when we started to have those conversations and it started to become more real. That's when I knew if we could do this in a small market like Wilmington, Delaware. I mean, Delaware is the second smallest state. Yeah. In, in the country. We still love Delaware. So, love right? love so to take it from here to a stage like Disney World, I'm, I was ready for the challenge, but I'm like, look, if we could do it here and there, we can do it anywhere. So oh my God. the planning process was crazy. The imagine. execution process was crazy, but it was well worth it. Um, we had almost 9,000 kids at our college fair and more wow. than $11 million in scholarships just in Disney awarded. So wow. the numbers you read have changed. I believe it. Um, I'm they sure get bigger it did. every what, year. I already know that's what I said. I'm pretty sure it changed, yep. Yeah, yeah. So awesome. um, Disney was such a gift. I love um, it. And the students there were so excited. And I just can't wait to keep, you know, expanding our territory, I got going it. to different places and making sure all the kids that, you know, look like me and you mm -hmm. have access to higher education. I love it. Now, it's, you mentioned Stephen A before I even got to him. So I know Stephen A's ambassador for HBCU Week. Um, now, given his platform, right, you know, obviously, like you said, one of the biggest sports anchors in the world. Obviously, yeah. he's a phenomenon at what he do. He graduated from an HBCU. Mm -hmm. Aside from his platform that he has, like, obviously doing what he does, how did you know that Stephen A was the right person? Like, yeah. how did you know that he fit the vision for HBCU and what it was? Yeah, sure. So, um, I was connected to uh, somebody here who was his college roommate. Mm, uh, he had come to, I know, it's so crazy, right? Wow. Uh, shout out to Monte Ross. Wow. Um, he had come to our HBC Week Awards Gala 
Um, and he, I had no idea that that was his college roommate, mm -hmm. right? So it was just through conversation, then making that connection and talking to him, learning about his HBCU experience, what he's done for his university. It just made so much sense, right? Um, because we wanted to continue to push the message out about HBCU Week. Yeah. And what better way to do it um, than by way of somebody that has a platform like Stephen A. Smith. Yeah. So um, it's been incredible to work with him. Um, the reach that we've sustained through that partnership is, I mean, it's, it's hard to really put into words yeah. how big it is. How is Stephen A. like, like in person? Like, what's his vibe like? I just know in he's person, like... You know, he's, he's great, you know. He, he makes you laugh. Um, uh, you can have some really deep conversations yeah. you know obviously he's very opinionated so you know he's always willing to talk through things about his position on things um and it's always cool for me to talk to hbc or alum that are a little older than me yeah, to see like what their experience was like how they look at hbcu culture now um he's just been very valuable to me personally and the brand i love it yeah and i know so kind of moving on a little bit i know you have um some scholarships that you guys offer i think you have nine different ones if i'm not mistaken is it nine or seven uh seven seven seven, seven, seven. different scholarship mm -hmm. awards that you guys give out um someone i'm being sponsors from you know nfl i believe mm -hmm. capital one yes um so for you as a ceo as like you know the person who's literally trying to make sure you're getting all of these partnerships how do you how does one prepare to, you know, present like, OK, look, I want to be a partner with you. I'm looking for, you know, funding and sponsorship money, things like that. Like, how did you prepare for those type of conversations, you know, especially with corporations like that or mm -hmm. businesses like that? Like, how do you prepare yourself as an HBCU alum? You know, people always, you know, not thinking that we belong in certain places. Mm -hmm. How are you able to just like. Just go in there and tackle it and make it happen. You know what I mean? Well, you know, I'm a two-time HBCU alum. I graduated from Howard in 2007. Mm -hmm. And then UDC Law School in 2013. And um, my law school experience and that education taught me um, to really advocate in a very articulate way, in a very convincing way, mm -hmm. for what I believe is right. Um, that coupled with my experience at Howard, because going to Howard really taught me that no it. matter what room I walk into, I'm valuable, my voice is necessary, it. it matters. And I don't care what everybody else looks like that's around me. I love it. I'm gonna say what needs to be said and I'm gonna get done what needs to get done. Um, and I don't know that I would have that same sense of self or confidence mm -hmm. if I didn't choose an HBCU. So all of those skills from my HBCU experience has prepared me for what I need to do to grow this brand. I love it. Um, and how did, uh, what made you choose Howard? But when you was looking for going through college choices, like what made you it's choose? It's so, so funny you asked me that. Okay, so um, I wanted to go to an HBCU and Spelman was always my first choice. I, 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 don't, I don't even know why. Everybody. I don't even have anything to connect to it, but shout out to all my Spelman sisters. Yeah. Um, but my parents sent me to an all-girls Catholic high school. Okay. So after that experience, or during that experience, I was like, I don't want to go to Spelman anymore. I'm tired of being around mm -hmm. all these girls, which was kind of an ignorant way of thinking because of how closely situated it is mm -hmm. to Morehouse and Clark and even Morris Brown now um, that has recently been um, accredited. So um, my juvenile mind at 15, 16 was like, nah, I'm going to Howard. I'm not going yeah. to Spelman. Um, but the process is interesting because... When I applied to Howard, I got rejected. Mm. I was rejected. I wasn't the best high school student. Um, and when I got that rejection letter, it was devastating, kind of confusing. And I was a little bit of arrogant, kind of arrogance mixed in that mm -hmm. as well. Because I'm like, wait, did they make a mistake? Don't like, you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I called the university and they're like, I think y'all might have made a mistake because I got a rejection letter. I That's think y'all may have meant to send that to someone else. Somebody else, right? Not me. So they said, oh, no, ma'am. <laughs> no, ma'am. You were see. absolutely supposed mm -hmm. to get that rejection. Um, you weren't as competitive as our applicant pool. Wow. And I'm like, but I feel like this is where I'm supposed to be. What do I do? Tell me what I could do to get there. Well, you have one last stitch effort. You could send us a letter trying to advocate to reverse your decision, but it's not promising. Wow. I'm like, okay. So I come from a home full of prayer and faith. My mother is a pastor. I have a long lineage of pastors and ministers in my family. Um, so we prayed about it day in and day out. I wrote that letter I don't know how many times because it just wasn't good yeah. enough until I felt like, okay, this is the one. Um, and my mother in true, true fashion of hers 
She put that letter right down in our living room floor. Mm. <laughs> she prayed over that letter. Wow. Um, and we mailed it off. And in two weeks, I got had an acceptance package on my doorstep. The power of prayer. Yes, man, the power of prayer. That's big. Okay, yeah. Now, when that happened, though, like, was there any type of, I mean, obviously, you spoke a little bit about how you felt after getting rejected, but, mm -hmm. like, throughout that time period when you got rejected and you was just waiting and just trying to figure out what was going on, what were the other options? Like, were you thinking of going somewhere else? Were you just going to say, I'm not going to school? Like, what, were, what was going to be the, the well, next I thing? Well, I didn't have a choice of not going to school. My parents gotcha. weren't going to allow that to happen. And at the time, my sister was already at Howard. Okay. I have an older brother who had already graduated from Delaware State, who's also a Kappa. Oh, for real? Uh, yeah. Uh, who is it? Uh, his nickname is Smurf. His name is Julian. Oh, he's 45, though, so he's a lot oh, he's older like than older. Okay, lot yeah, older, yeah. y'all. So shout out to Julian. Okay. Hey, if you see this. Shout out to Julian. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um... It wasn't, not going to college was not an option, but in my high school, which is very disappointing, they were encouraging uh, Newman and Cabrini and University of Delaware, mm -hmm. schools that I just didn't feel any connection to, um, and they were even offering me money. Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of at a standstill. I didn't know what I was going to do, um, but I've always been somebody that locks in. As you should. And, and once I lock in, there is no plan B. As you should. So I didn't As have... I didn't have a plan B. I was like, I got to go to Howard. So even though I had anxiety about it, I cried about it. I prayed about it. I didn't know what the end result was going to be, but it ended up working in my favor. I love that. We're going to kind of, for the sake of time, we're going to kind of just move forward to like a little bit more personal stuff. You know, okay. I want to be able to, you know, get to know Ashley a little bit. So okay. I've learned, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I've learned that you like hip hop. Right, oh, you're, I love. You're a hip hop fan, yes, right? Yes, and I you, do. Yes, and I you, do. and some of your favorite artists are Jay Z, mm -hmm. right? And Kanye, I believe. And you know that's that's, I, I'm, that's no, a I'm gonna sword. get to him. Okay. I'm gonna get to him. Okay. Kanye and okay. Rihanna. Do you like Rihanna too? Love Rihanna. Okay. Love Rihanna. So before we get to Kanye, yeah. So how were they influential in you know in your time growing up? Right. You know you like music. You like mm -hmm. hip hop. You know obviously hip hop is very important in culture today. Yes. You know, they have so much influence. Mm -hmm. Um, how were they influential to you? Like, what made you attract to them? Like, their music, their words? Like, yeah. when did you become a fan of hip-hop and R&B and music and all those things? So, my brother was heavy into hip-hop. He used to, like, write his raps. He used to think he was a rapper when we were younger. Oh, yeah. um, and he's eight years older than me. So, like, uh, in the summertime, I wasn't supposed to do this. So, Mom, if you see this, I'm sorry. <laughs> she probably would. But in the summertime... At like two o'clock in the morning, he would go downstairs and watch BET Uncut, right? Mm, okay. All the hip hop videos. And I would okay. sneak out of bed and go down and watch with him, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember this is my when did you fall in love with hip hop moment. I was 11 years old. It was the summer of 1996. Wow, I was one years old. <laughs> yes. I was one years and we're, old. We're in the family room watching BET Uncut. And Jay-Z and Foxy Brown's Ain't No, you know what, I don't know if there's profanity allowed on here, yeah, so I'll just say Ain't No. Yeah, okay. Whatever, yeah, you good. Okay, you good. came on the video. And I, from that moment on, I lived and breathed hip-hop music. Like, wow, that's you amazing. You couldn't tell me nothing about Jay-Z. That's amazing. I was buying all the CDs. That's amazing. Like, the culture of it all, just the messaging behind it. And I'm 11 years old at this point, right? Wow. So, um... That's when I fell in love with it, and it, it never stopped. Jay-Z is still my I favorite love it. rapper. And it looks like you love fashion, too. I can see you, you love fashion. I very do. Big on fashion. Very important. This is good. So now, <laughs> when I say Kanye, you had a little bit of a, you know, you had a little bit of a <sighs> thing here. So it's only right that I ask you, and just being a lawyer, too. I, well, you know, I just feel like you have a lot of knowledge in it, but where, what is going on? Like, what do you think is, like, <laughs> is what, going what do you on? Think, yeah, like, what do you think, where does he stand in your, you know, in your book? You know, um, I had to make the very unfortunate decision. And it's funny you asked that today because I don't know if you saw, like, everybody's, like, year play, like, who you listen to most, the songs oh, on Spotify mm -hmm. and Apple Music. Kanye West was number one all number year. One? Three of my top five songs, Kanye West, right? And wow. I'm looking through that, and I'm like, dang, how did this happen, you know? Because wow. I met Kanye West back in 2003 at Howard University during homecoming outside on the yard he's on campus this is when he was saying on campus he with john legend yeah funny. with john legend and i'm talking to him in a sprinter van this is my favorite, favorite rapper, artist. college dropout 2003. he was the big yeah he was big yeah oh my gosh crazy. so just to see the transition of who he is now versus then it's really heartbreaking it yeah. is um he's not stable mentally i think um Something is to be said about all the people that still book him for their podcast and gotcha. still push that content out. 
Do you think they just do that? I, I think they do that, obviously, just for numbers, probably, because he talks yeah. about a lot of stuff that are, like, blasphemous at this point. So mm-hmm. it's, like, really irrelevant. So I think they just getting him on there just to... Yeah. But he's at a point where he really don't care no more. And it's really crazy yeah. to see. I think that's, that's very, very wild. Yeah. Do you think that there's... Do you support anything that he says? Do you think there's some type of truth to that stuff, though? I all? will say... But I think it's, like, a... It's a it's a pro and a con, obviously. I feel like, yeah, the things that he says is crazy and it might yeah. be, you know, a little absurd. But at the same time, he has been places that a lot of us haven't been. Mm-hmm. And people are only going to judge him based on, like, you know, what they know or what they see. Yeah. So how do you feel about that? Do you think that there might be some things going on that we might not know about in terms of, like, what he says? Yeah. I mean, I think I have, I've, I've decided that I have to step away and Got not it. support him right Got now. It. Of course. But just being a super fan for like the past several years up until, you know, mm-hmm. this new version of him has has been in our faces on the media day after day. Um he there are a lot of things that he says that right. resonate and make sense. And I used my friends used to joke and we would laugh because I'm a Gemini. He's a Gemini. It's a, mm-hmm. Geminis who are visionaries and creatives are very different. Mm. They are very different. Good to and know. I see it in Kanye West. Um, and Donald Trump's a Gemini, mm-hmm. right? I don't agree with anything that he does or what he says. But the thing about Donald Trump is he locks in. What he wants to get done, no matter how radical or crazy it is, he's going to do whatever it is necessary Absolutely. to get there. And I, I say it all the time to people. If the Democratic Party had a Donald Trump for our our mission and our vision and the things that we need, like redirecting that energy to something that's that's powerful for mm-hmm. us, yep. we would be in a much better position. Right. He's a dream come true for his party. Wow. Whether it's the regular Republicans or the MAGA, that he is pushing their agenda the best way that he knows how. And we don't have anybody on our side that's that's radical or courageous enough to step forward and say, because what I find is Democrats like to take the high road. Mm. And I love the Obamas, right? Mm. I love Michelle Obama. Mm. But the whole we they go low, we go high thing. I don't conform mm. to that. I don't I conform to that at all. Wow. Because there are a lot of times where you can't afford that. Absolutely. I mean, our lives depend on it. Absolutely. So sometimes you got to meet people where they are Absolutely. to get what you need to get done accomplished. So Dang. there are things that Kanye West says that I, I do subscribe to, it, but I can't I can't take You're the time honest. to to sift through everything yeah. he's saying and, and say, well, I, I support this, but not that he's done yeah. way too much damage to align with. So I think he's really serious about running for president. <laughs> do you think how do you think that'll turn out? Do you think he'll end up winning? I think it's the biggest joke of all time, and he needs to really just isolate himself. Wow, that was a fire <laughs> response. He needs to just isolate himself and get better. And get better. Not for real, I agree. All right, moving on. Enough of Kanye. Okay. Um, are you a vegan? I call myself vegan-ish, right? Vegan-ish. So it's been just about four years. Okay. I haven't had any meat. I haven't had any seafood. I had any seafood. But I love eggs. Okay. So sometimes I eat eggs and sometimes I'll eat cheese. Okay. So vegans don't eat dairy. And is there a story behind that? Like, is there is something that happened or is there anything that just made you want to just try it out? Like, well, you? you know, I was looking and searching for ways to be my healthiest self. I love it. Okay. Um, and I was trying to figure out, you know, I was never an overweight person. I was always healthy. Um, but I felt like I needed to do more. So I All started right. to just explore things and... When I tried that, it just felt better. I like it. I became addicted to the feeling of not eating those things, and that's how I was successful in just maintaining that diet. So when you first started, though, because I'm like even me and him, we have these conversations all the time. We just be like, "Yo, we need to get this up, get this up." Like before you actually made the commitment to go vegan, ish. Yeah. Like how long did it take you to really make the decision? You know what I'm saying? Like to say, "Ah, right, well, I'm a practice vegan ish," but you probably were still sneaking like little things. But like, when did you really say, "Ah, right, you know what? That's enough." Like, no well, more. you know, it's that's that Gemini visionary lock-in personality it. type. It's, like when I decided to time. do it, then I I contacted a health coach. I spoke to her, and within a week, it was done. And the crazy thing about it is, my son he doesn't pay me any mind. Like he wants his chicken, his steak, his all. So I still have to make it. Wow. Um, Wow. But yeah, like it's I just, just like made it was just time. Yeah. And you speak about your son, man, uh, motherhood, right? I think that's you know your mom, a CEO, a lawyer. You do so many different things. 
Like, what is the motherhood experience like? Is that your only child? Yes. There's one child, right? Mm-hmm. All right, so what is that, you know, having your, your one little man? And yeah. Like, what's that relationship like? You know, being so busy and having all of these, you know, obligations and responsibilities, how do you still find time to kind of nurture your boy and, and really still be present, yeah. you know, in his life? Well, you know, I tell people all the time, me and my son, we grew up together. I had him when I was in college. So um, I found out I was expecting <laughs> right after I got offline. <laughs> Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> it's like within a month, I was pregnant. What? After I that's got offline, crazy. I pledged as a junior. Uh, shout out to Alpha Chapter, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Uh-huh. Um, Talk to him. Yeah, so um, soon as I got offline, I'm like, oh my gosh. So I ended up having him um, the February before I graduated. So I had him in February, graduated in May. And that was another crazy experience because my mother said, you better graduate on time. Mm. So I had to figure out how to get my credit satisfied, how to go back and forth, you know, doctor's appointments, but I made it happen. Um, so he was three months at my graduation with me at Howard. Wow. And, um, you know, like people say, it's true. There's no blueprint to motherhood, right? So we're growing up together. I'm young, just, you know, getting out of college. Um, and it's like having like a little best friend. I love it. You know, he it. is, his, his power of discernment is something that, I admire so much about him because I keep Amazing. him with me when I do a lot of things because I like him to get access and have the experience of the things that I do. Yeah. And he can kind of look at things and, and say, nah, mom, mom. Nah, mom, I'm not with, with that. I'm not with it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I love that, man. I think having that mother-son relationship is so awesome, especially, you know, you still being finding time to be present, yeah. you know, with everything yeah. you got going on. But mm-hmm. having said that, in contrast, is there ever moments where you feel like you can do more as a mom? You know, Because oh, I know there goodness. might be some people listening that, you know, that inspires to do many things. I want to have a family and, and want to be so successful. But being a parent is a top, pri- it's a top priority, mm-hmm. right? And I'm sure with you being that, you know, that, that lady that you are, that's very aggressive about her passions and things, um, there's moments where it's just like, man, I just really wish I was there a lot more. So has there been like small moments where you just wish that, damn, I just wish I was there for my son? And I had like to really like settle into the fact that I can't do everything, mm. right? So I learned, um, I would say, a few years ago that there is no such thing as balance. People say, I'm a balance. There's no such thing. What you have to do is, prior, what's, what's going to be your priority for the day? And, and, and let me look in your face and tell you this. Let me look on your face and tell you this. Every day, it's not going to be your children. Wow. It can't be. Because you have yourself, you have your child, you have your business, any of the other things that you have going on. Look, my son is 15. I'm sorry, I'm a door dash your food. I can't cook it tonight, mm. right? Or if I have something to do for HBCU week, you know, versus any other responsibility. It's all about prioritizing what needs your attention that day. Wow. Yeah, and, and I think wow. the sooner, uh, you know, people in position like me can kind of get a handle on that because you can, I mean, you feel guilty about not, you know, having the dedication and time and attention to a lot of things, but you're one person. You know what's so crazy? Shout out to William Toms, um, but I just recently interviewed him a couple weeks ago. Uh, He's, he, uh, have you heard of Rec Philly? I haven't. He's like the CEO of like Rec Philly. They just partnered with P. Diddy. Oh, nice. I asked him, how does he manage, you know, doing so much and being busy? And the answer that he gave was, you can't be balanced or, you know, you got to ha- live an unbalanced lifestyle. <laughs> Pretty much saying that yep. the thing is that what we try to do is we just try to find time for everything that don't necessarily matters yep. as opposed to just taking care of what's important for you at that point in time. Mm-hmm. So to hear you say that, yeah, like literally real. right after he said the same thing, yeah. it's like, bro, he literally just yeah, said the same thing. Yeah, I love thing. that. It's so real. Though. And I feel like that's a entrepreneurial creative type of thing though you know what I mean yeah. I feel like with people like us that's where it come from mm-hmm. and last thing about your son is like you know does he ever you know he ain't having like a brother or sister so and it might be a little crazy but does he ever get lonely sometimes like, you know, he, think, like oh my gosh he used to when he was younger yeah. um but I think now he, he's kind of grown out of that so he's like I'm cool yeah, being the only yeah, child he likes I it. couldn't be by myself man I think it's, it's crazy I got three siblings and I'm the youngest okay but shout out to him man I think that's awesome yeah. all right and October 12th 2014, right? October 12, October 12 2014. 2014. That's, that's a good book title. 10, yeah. 12, 14. That would be... <laughs> hey, look. You heard it here first. It yeah. might happen. Mm-hmm. So October 12, 20, uh, 2014, uh, 29 years old. Just the story. You, you had mm-hmm. an unfortunate, you know, stroke and it, yeah. it came about. 
Mm -hmm. Just tell us, you know, how, how that day came about, how that changed your life. Yeah. You know, up until today. So I'm 29 years old. Um, I wake up in the morning and it happened to be my mother's pastoral anniversary. And shout out to my parents because I'm 29. I had graduated from law school. I'm in the middle of studying for the bar and I was allowed to live at home. OK, y'all. So I'm still That's living with my parents yeah. at this time. So I would like to just plug real quick right no, here. No, please go ahead. Please. That black people, our kids don't got to get out at 18. Y'all don't have to get out at 18. That, Please Felix? don't force them out at 18. We're building, we're creating, we're trying to sustain that, things and grow. And if you have the capacity to offer housing to your children, Look please do it. Wow, I love that. So That's thank you, mom and dad, for that because, you know. That's awesome. Um, so I'm 29 years old. Me and my son are living at my parents' house. Wake up for... Um, my mother's pastoral anniversary, and I felt a little tired, so I'm like, let me go lay down for a little bit. Then like 20 minutes late, like I set my alarm, and it was like I was groggy, like waking up out of my sleep, and I couldn't move on the right side of my body. And initially I felt like, you know how like they say like your arm fell asleep or your mm -hmm. foot fell asleep? And then they just get numb for a second. Yeah, so, huh. but I'm literally looking at my hand and telling it to move and it wouldn't, like wouldn't move. So I mustered up the energy to like call for my mom and I'm like, something's wrong, something. She's like, what's wrong with you? Cause I was looking like I was kind of going in and out of consciousness. And she put her hands on my face and told me to smile and I couldn't. Wow. So she knew immediately that I was having a stroke. 29 years old, what I thought was optimal health, um, a good weight, uh, relatively active. And she immediately called the ambulance. And I'll never forget this because it irritates me to my core. Wow. As soon as the ambulance arrived, they asked me if I um, was a user of like hard drugs. Like, do you use heroin? They asked me all yeah, this crazy sure. stuff. And I'm like, no, I don't use the damn heroin. Like, figure out what's wrong with me. So they took me to the hospital and like, you, you had a stroke. I couldn't move the right side of my body. Um, and it was just the craziest experience ever. And they couldn't figure out why. So I had a neurologist, I had mm -hmm. a hematologist for my blood, I had a cardiologist to look at my heart. All these doctors meeting, like, why did she have a stroke? And it was from birth control. It was from birth control use. Wow. So um, I know that we like to plan our families and, and make sure that um, we're doing things on a specific time, but uh, that's one of the worst things you can put in your body. Mm. One of the worst things that you can put in your body. Um, and unfortunately, like we do it for years, right? Like girls are getting on birth control younger and younger and younger, um, whether it's to regulate your period or whatever the case may be, whether you're sexually active and don't want to get pregnant. But it, it's just, it's not, a, it's, it doesn't, it's not a good thing. Wow. That's, that's yeah. deep. Yeah. And you know, where, where were you, like, at that point in your life in terms of career-wise and, like, what was next? Like, how long was it, did it take for you to get healthy, like, to, to get back to 100%? Like, where were you in your life at that point in time, and how did it kind of hold you back or, you know, prolong, you know, what was going on for you? Well, um, the story, actually, um, it expands. So mm. I'm in the hospital. They find out it's attributed to um, birth control. So they start putting me on blood thinners, trying to get me back to my normal self. I'm going through therapy. I had to learn to write again. Wow. Um, and they did, a, I forgot what the procedure is called, but they stick a small camera down your throat to look closely at your heart. Um, and there was a blood clot attached to my artery. And they're like, we got to go and get that out because if it detaches and she has another stroke, we don't know what's going to happen. So now not only did I have a stroke, but they got to cut my chest open. Oh my God. Cut my chest open. So like, I have to get heart surgery. So all this stuff is happening and I'm just trying to figure out like why, what is the purpose? How is this happening? My son is seven years old at the time. Like I don't want him to lose a parent because mm -hmm. I didn't know what was next for me. You know, I had a stroke and now I'm facing open heart surgery. So um, they did that, that close look at my heart. We scheduled the, the open heart surgery. And two days before the open heart surgery, they went in and looked at it again. They saw, you know, the clot was still there because they just wanted to make sure everything was okay. Um, and it hadn't moved, so it was still there. The night before my surgery, I get a phone call from my doctor saying, we have to push your surgery back by two days 
because your insurance like is not going through and i'm like i work for the state i have the best this is why i'm doing my clerkship like um at the courthouse i'm like i have great insurance what do you mean so i'm on the phone like beefing because i had already prepared myself like all right i'm ready ready. we're gonna go in we're gonna get this done now you got more time to think oh my gosh so my mom's like no wait wait ashley like let it play out we'll get it together just calm down so two days pass we go to the hospital. They put me under anesthesia, um, prepare me to go into surgery. My mom had everybody locking hands in prayer. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm on the, 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 the bed. It's me, the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, everybody. She summoned everybody. Mm-hmm. We're going to pray before you take my daughter back here and cut her chest open. So we prayed. The last thing I remember is the anesthesiologist telling me, um, I like your nail polish. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget her face or what she said because I fell asleep almost immediately. Yeah. I wake up to like five people standing over me, my mom, my dad, my doctor, and they have like these weird smiles on their face. I'm like, why is everybody smiling? They're like, you didn't need the surgery. I'm like, what do you mean I didn't need the surgery? Yo, well, God is crazy. well, we went in right before and, and the clock was gone. That is crazy. It's not there. We don't have to do it no more. Yo, that's crazy. We didn't have to cut you open. That's crazy. I can't lie. That's that is unimaginable crazy. and the surgeon said look i even called my friend from penn because i'm like yo this is what it looked like two days ago this is now like he's like you can't you can't cut open for a healthy heart leave her alone yo, crazy right pray pray yeah pray, I'm, t- I'm telling you pray, the craziest thing and my pray. mom the mom swears to this day like god was working on that when my insurance wasn't going through so those days when they called me and said now nah, you got to wait we're pushing it back he was like, he was I figuring need, it he, out. He, he, was, he was giving me the procedure I needed. He was figuring it out. Without me having to go and get my chest cut open, right? So it's, I'm oh. telling you, man, life, life is, those are the moments you got to hold on to when, when it feels like it's impossible. It's not going to work and it's the end of the world. Like those are the moments. And I'm grateful for those lows because I know that there's nothing that guy can't do. Because that's you know? like really when you use that. Yeah. Oh, my that's gosh. That's like a very low point. Mm. Like, has there been anything that compares to like the Nothing. type of pain or the type of feeling that, that you've been through during that time? No. That right there, I'll never forget it. It's, it's the, the most powerful thing I've ever experienced. And I'm grateful for the people that were around me that could experience it with me because now it, it enhances their faith. Yeah. Because there's no nothing, nothing so special or unique about me that it can't happen to somebody else, right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, only Ashley can experience this miracle. No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. And we almost gonna wrap this up. Um, how do you encourage? How do you encourage somebody? You know that has moments where they feel like they're down, defeated. Like, how do you encourage somebody to muster up the courage to to remember those moments where? They persevere through things, right? Especially mm-hmm. as a woman. So I want you to talk to the women specifically because I know women are a lot more emotional than men. Yeah. Um, so how do you encourage just like a young lady that might be listening and watching um, that whatever you're going through, just muster up that courage to, you know, stay faithful and believe that, you know, it's, it's all going to work out, you know? Oh, yeah, for sure. So one, um, hold on to those moments when you're low because you always come out of them, Absolutely. right? So you can go back and remember uh, where you were and where you are now. But I had to decide for me a long time ago, because what I'm doing right now, like it looks so glamorous, so sexy, and like Mm -hmm. all these things are happening and so successful, but it's hard. The work is hard. And um, when you have dreams as big as I do, you know, sometimes it's met with doubt and security. You can't do that. How you gonna? I made up a long time ago that there is not a devil in hell or on earth Mm because they around us here too that's going to get in between me and the assignment that god put on my life and that's how you got to move you got to move like that because if you don't then you're putting everything at risk and it's not even about you there are so many people tied to your calling absolutely and when you don't answer it you're leaving all them people in bondage absolutely so you got to take yourself out of it for a second listen to your convictions what god told you to move on and just do it. Wow, I love that. Okay. So I, heard, I saw on your bio as well that Psalm nineteen fourteen is your favorite uh, verse. Is that right? Yeah, there's a few though. There's a few. Yeah. Okay, so being that I read this one, you know, what does that specifically mean to you? Like, how did, why did that become? Like, how does that message stand out to Ashley? It's really just holding on to your faith. 
Like you have to be faithful and you have to know that it's not your flesh. Because a lot of people credit themselves for the things that they accomplish. Mm -hmm. Like I did this, look what I did, look how much I got, look how much I, it's not even about you. Man. It's about the faith that you have in God and just move, like moving towards whatever your higher calling is. Like, and it's so important every day for me to ask God to order my steps. Order my steps. Because I don't want to veer off of the path that he has right. for me. Right. Because as soon as I fall out of the obedience of his will, I'm no longer protected. Whatever mm. happens, happens. Yep. So it's, it's really about just continuing to have my ear and my heart to God and following them, even when it's uncomfortable. Wow. Because I know the end result is always going to be greater than what I could do in my own flesh. I love that. Yeah. And, damn, you just gave us, like, a lot of a lot of great value. And I appreciate you, again, for taking, yeah. you know, time out of your busy schedule and, and coming on and, and really just giving us what we needed to hear and allowing the people to see a more, I wouldn't say vulnerable, but a more open you. No, right? yeah. I think, again, you do a lot of amazing things for... You know, not just the city of Delaware, but just all over the place. You know what I mean? Giving, you know, children, not children, but kids and teens mm -hmm. an opportunity to go to college, yeah. get money for colleges. So um, huge fan of HBCU, huge fan of you, huge Thanks. fan of everything that you got going on. I'm super grateful again for you coming on the show. And if you guys enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, comment, you know, leave some questions, feedback. Um, you know, I will definitely respond and give you all of the information that you need to hear. It'll be available on Apple Music, Spotify, all that good stuff. So you remember, you saw it first. Ashley Christopher, thank you again. Peace thank out. We love y'all. Yeah, get, on. get to the cake. I'm on a mission for maze, no matter how long it's gonna take. I could just see it already. Give me that new Benz or the Wraith. Watching my own back where I'm from, it was never safe. Yeah. Need a hundred M's up in the safe uh -huh. Last chance, life a movie uh -huh. Roll another one and get baked Mix the honor wealth with the Gucci yeah. You know when I get up in it uh -huh. I promise you gon' catch feelings All you gotta do is hold it down I told you I'ma kill these niggas 